Go drink your raw goat milk there, Tom. Yeah. I, no, I, I should I should say that I appreciate the comments about uh, about goat milk. I appreciate the interaction from our viewers, and uh, yeah. maybe I should clarify that I have nothing against raw milk. Uh, but like I was, as I was telling Joe, is that like I eat mac and cheese from a box. <laughs> Welcome to episode forty four of Farm to Markets. Today we are talking about if we're already in a recession, if you should move to a cheaper state in retirement, and we have more lightning round questions at the end. On June 28th, Kathy Woods, a, uh, a popular mutual fund manager known for taking big positions in innovative tech companies, said she believes the U.S. economy is already in a recession. Is she correct? Uh, yeah, I, I think she is. Uh, if we look at Q1 GDP data, I think it was down 1.5%. Uh, another quarter with a negative GDP number that's the government's way of technically deciding we're in a recession. I think that's pretty likely to happen. Um, that's just the headline way to figure it out. Um, I like kind of looking at some of the background data that's not necessarily as well reported. So everybody knows like CPI right now is 8.6%. Other measures that either the government or big investment firms use range between 10 and 20%. Uh, for, for their inflation measures, um, including one that's the original CPI calculation, which main distinction is it doesn't take into account uh, consumer changes in purchases. So for example, uh, if ground beef costs three bucks a pound at the store and goes to four and ground chicken goes from two bucks a pound to three, well, ground beef experienced 33% inflation and ground chicken experienced 50% inflation. But CPI says if you buy that ground chicken, now at three bucks a pound, you experienced 0% inflation because you're not spending any more money than you used to be, even though both products went up double digit percentages. Um, so the, the, me the measure that doesn't take that into account is saying it's around 16, 17% right now. So inflation data is really bad. Other data though, you look at railway tonnage being moved around in the United States, it's down almost 3% with the last batch of data available. Consumer spending has been declining in spite of inflation. Uh, wages are not rising fast enough to keep up with inflation. Last job opening data, I think it was down 450,000 jobs. So 450,000 fewer jobs were, were open. Uh, with the last data, and just look at debt. So consumer debt, business debt, government debt, a lot of that just piled up in Q1 2022. Some of that, of course, is going to be, you know, everybody and their dog is trying to borrow as much as they can while rates are still low. But when you have another, another data point, factory orders in the U.S. are down two and a half to three percent, but you go to China, they're down 20 to 30 percent, depending on whose data you're looking at. So clearly people are not buying things. And when they are buying things, it seems to be they're putting the essentials on credit cards. Uh, so the long and short of everything to me suggests that, yeah, absolutely, we're in a recession. People are spending more on the things that they can't live without, and they're putting it on credit. Everything seems to be signaling, yeah, the economy is contracting. I think she could be right. Um, I don't really know. Uh, I don't think anyone will actually really know until months after the fact, after we, we've already been in one for, for a while. Um, even if we are in a recession um, or if we're going to be in one, I think people get a little too wrapped around the axle with just the declaration of a recession. Uh, the times before and after recession don't seem to matter as much until it's actually been declared. It's kind of like uh, the classic scene from Looney Tunes when there's a character, they're running out over the cliff um, and then they hang there for a while and then they look down and they either get scared and they run back or they look down and they fall to their death. Um, all a recession is, is a group of eight people that declare a recession. Um, this is a committee and they just, they have the switch, they turn it on, they turn it off. And unlike the broad strokes version where GDP has to contract for two consecutive quarters. This committee actually looks at a lot more than GDP. Uh, they factor in things like personal income, employment, consumer spending, um, retail wholesale, um, 
uh, sales and industrial production. Uh, the bottom line is economists can't infer a trend based on one single data point. Uh, there have been times in history where recessions have been declared with or without two consecutive quarters of economic decline. So if a recession worries you, um, if you're worried about it, whether we're in one or whether we're going to be in one or neither, um, stick to the milestones, pay off your debt, avoid debt after that point, save an emergency fund, save and invest in yourself in retirement. Uh, recessions are normal and they're certainly not felt nearly as bad as those who are prepared. Yesterday, Drew was helping with some chores around the property and uh, he had asked me, he said, hey, uh, um, did it rain here? at the house and i said no not at all i said i had like one drop of rain driving home from work and i i couldn't tell if it was a bird doing his business on my windshield or not because it was just that one drop and that was it and, and, and drew said well my gosh in kalispell it was just deluged with rain north north kalispell and i said no not here and i think recession is kind of like the weather rock that almost every boy scout camp dining facility has in the front and a weather rock is basically a rock suspended by a rope on a tripod and with a sign on it that says uh if if this walk if this uh if this rock is wet it's raining if uh, if this rock is is it if this rock is rocking the wind is blowing if it's gone you, we're, we're having a hurricane so it basically states the obvious and to any degree the word recession is nothing more than a economist term that is thrown around by politicians. If you're in power, it's not a recession. We're just getting through a difficult time. But if you're the opposing party, it's, it's what's being imposed on you by this bad administration. The reality is recession essentially is, is, is are you making less money? Do you have less net worth than you had yesterday? Um, it's like we're all standing around waiting for the experts to tell us what we already see on the weather rock. We see, the, we see the wetness on the rock. We're just waiting for experts to tell us that the rock is wet so we can confirm that it's raining. So I think for many people, yes, they are already in a recession, but it's really just a word used by pundits to, 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 to sell news broadcasts. Hey, Joe, uh, real quick, do you mind turning your volume down just a little bit so I don't get okay. feedback? Hey, then. Also, is that the thing that Kathy Wood was also uh, pointing out is um, uh, build up in inventories. So specifically, like Target and Walmart are having a build up in inventory, and you're also seeing uh, demand uh, for uh, for some uh, commodity prices dropping. For instance, uh, lumber is down from its uh, its high of about uh, one thousand seven hundred dollar one thousand seven hundred dollars per one thousand board feet is down to six hundred thirty dollars per uh, for one thousand board feet. Which is you know back into it, which is high, still historically high, but back into historical norms, and I, I don't know if I would you know specifically pin my re recession uh, predictions on build up in inventory for uh, for you know specific retailers and lumber prices coming off of one of the biggest um, you know we, one of the biggest uh, uh, two years for for demand that we've probably ever seen. Uh, you know, the pandemic years basically accelerated a whole bunch of demand into two years. And, in, you know, retailers like Target and Walmart basically had to accelerate their production to keep up with that demand. And now they're starting to see that demand taper off. And now they're and, and they're going to have to adjust their productions to, uh, to to deal with that. You know, for instance, Amazon has, uh, you know, it's, it's basically said that it overhired um, during the pandemic and it needed to. It had so much volume coming in that they had to and they had so many workers out with COVID and, and all kinds of stuff that they had to hire way more workers than they would typically need. And now that, you know, COVID restrictions are going away, uh, demand is subsiding. They're, they are having to lay off a bunch of these, uh, these workers that they, that they hired during these, uh, during these years where demand was, uh, was just, you know, abnormally high. Same thing with the uh, JP Morgan hired a bunch of people during these years to keep up with all the demand that they had coming into the company. And now they're starting to see that slow and you're starting to see people uh, with job offers that are getting rescinded and, um, and they're starting to let people go. So, I mean, and you look at all this stuff and, you know, first quarter GDP was negative. So if we get in August, another negative quarter of GDP, that will definitely be in a recession. But you also have to, the fact that companies had to adjust to a really high period of really high, or excuse me, a period of really high demand. And now they're having to start to kind of normalize their operations again. And the fact that everybody accelerated their spending into a two-year period, 
probably means there is going to be a small recession coming because you know they've, they've essentially bought the things that they that they've wanted um even though it continues to buy things like durable goods medicine groceries and that kind of stuff but yeah i mean so she's probably right we're probably headed into some some kind of recession whether you want to you know uh label it or not but uh coming off two years where lots of spending was accelerating it you're probably going to get some type of uh slowdown here pretty soon to drew's point those people who have no debt the, the fed is doing everything they possibly can to put a hand on inflation and, and one of the their primary tools is just to raise interest rates. If you need to borrow money just to, 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 to survive, then you're at an extreme disadvantage. But for people who don't have any debt, it is to your advantage when interest rates go up because you can actually lend people money. You can lend the government and get more income. You can lend money to corporations, get more income. You can lend money to banks and get more income. So be a lender instead of a borrower when these sorts of things happen. And that pretty much recession proofs whatever finances you actually have experience yourself. Right. There, there's a big difference between feeling icky about the economy and being bummed out by inflation and uh, worrying about losing your house because you can't, you don't, you won't have a job anymore. Um, right. And those are the two different scenarios with how you're positioned financially going into a recession. All right. Uh, moving on is that uh, a study conducted by a moving company called Hire a Helper found that 38% of retirees move to a different state uh, when they're ready to retire. Uh, so according to the study, Virginia uh, was the number one destination, followed by Florida, then Wyoming, Pennsylvania, and Idaho for the top, basically the top five states. Uh, what, do you think, uh, what do you think of the idea about retirees moving to a different state uh, for retirement? Well, I think it's, it was number one, it's not really a new trend. Um, number two, I think it's really just a matter of necessity. If you, if you're switching, let's say you work in New York city and you're a lawyer or a doctor or whatever, make pretty good money. Uh, and then it's time to retire. Well, you know, now if, if you're going to be going on to a fixed income, you probably want to try and avoid taxes as much as possible. Maybe you want to sell that, uh, apartment or condo you have, and uh, turn it into a few hundred grand plus a house somewhere warmer where you don't have a little snow. Um, I think that's that's totally normal and reasonable. Um, it's it's not really a surprise that it's happening. You know, I, here here uh, out in the West, we see a lot more people from the West Coast when when they get ready to retire. You know, like from Seattle or Portland or the Bay Area or whatever. They have a three bed, two bath house worth $1.4 million that they can turn into a three bed, two bath house that costs 500 grand and uh, basically live off the rest. So I, I don't really see it as surprising. Um, it's not really, not really a new trend. Um, I, th I think for people who, who can't really afford to live in those expensive states on a fixed income because their income is just not gonna be increasing like it had been over, over their career, Probably a good idea to take a look at moving somewhere else, but um, if you're already comfortable, if you're pretty wealthy and you like where you are, maybe just stay put. I would like to live in a world where every retiree is in a financial position to do whatever they want. Um, I believe that if you live in the United States with enough planning and enough hard work, I think you can enjoy your golden years the way you want. And I know some people will argue with me about that, but uh, that's what I believe. So I like the idea of retiree, retirees moving to another state if that's what they ultimately want to do. Perhaps they're moving to be close with family. Uh, perhaps they want to live in a different climate. Uh, maybe they're seeking a different lifestyle. And all of those reasons are good reasons to move. Um, coming at this from a financial angle, certainly some states are cheaper than others. Some states have higher state and um, local taxes. Some states, the prices of goods and services are higher. So if you're moving to another state because you're forced into it, because you don't have enough money to live in the state that you really want to live, that's a bad thing. And I think that would probably be from a lack of good financial planning. So when I'm helping people plan for retirement, um, the, the first step isn't handing them a list of the cheapest states to live in in the country. Um, it's more of a process, um, helping them plan over a lifetime to meet their goals and ultimately experience well, lives well lived. 
uh, I have to ditto a lot of what Drew said, but I, but I do say occasionally I, I do hand people a list of some of the cheapest states to live when they've already lived a lifetime of productivity and their options are rather limited and they desperately want to figure out how to have a retirement of dignity. Sometimes I say, you know, um, you could sell your house at the top of the market right now and, and move to West Virginia or Ohio or Indiana and immediately um, have a comfortable retirement with dignity by doing so. Um, but to Drew's point, what I really like to tell folks is, is that with good planning and, uh, um, and, and, and discipline, you, you should organize your life in such a way that you can do whatever you want. If you want to move to a, you know, Newport Beach, California, then start planning on how that's going to happen today. But if you're already living in Newport, California or Whitefish, Montana, and uh, you, you made a lot of financial mistakes, uh, but you, you made one good mistake and you bought a house uh, when the markets were low and, and now the house is extraordinarily high, maybe you take that windfall and, uh, and, and, and speed up the process of retirement and, and move to a low rent district and uh, live your retirement years with dignity. And then vacation in places like Newport Beach and, and, and Whitefish. Those are good things. Uh, you know, things to consider when you do this, though, is uh, the weather. So, you know, I, you know, Florida is obviously nice. It does tend to get, you know, pretty hot uh, in the summertime. Uh, Pennsylvania is one that I knew nothing about. Uh, I've never really considered Pennsylvania as a uh, retirement state, but I've heard, but from what I've seen, it's good things. But a lot of them were in places that get pretty hot and muggy in the, the summertime. And I also did a quick search of, you know, some of the highest crime, rate, c crime rates. And some of these towns are pretty close to cities that have some of the highest crime rates in, in the U.S. Um, I did see uh, um, uh, Indiana was one of the uh, uh, cheapest uh, states to retire in. I've never been there, but Drew, would you uh, would you retire in the state of Indiana? Absolutely not. Yeah. So, so, so that there is uh, there's some compromises you have to make. You know, also, is, you know, where's your family at? Uh, if your family's in Montana and you're moving down to Florida, you know, all of a sudden your costs for uh, for coming to see them or having for them to come see you uh, get a lot higher. So there's a lot of things to consider when you do that. You want to just move just because it's cheaper. Um, you know, a lot of times like Alabama, you know, can get hot and muggy in the summer. Uh, even though it's it's pretty the the cost of living there is pretty cheap so there's lots of things to consider before you do it and if uh, you know you got your family there and it's cheaper to live there and you don't mind uh tornadoes and in, in the in the weather then uh, then do it but uh but there's lots of things to consider before you just move because of the price <clears throat> all right uh, let's uh move on to the lightning round All right. Uh, last month, Chris Pronger is a famous hockey player uh, with a bunch of accolades. And uh, so he's, you know, back in the, you know, the, the 90s, early 2000s, he was a uh, defenseman for the St. Louis Blues. So really good hockey player, lots of accolades. Basically went on, uh, he's been retired for a while, but basically went on Twitter and ranted about uh, wealth management. And in his remarks, he basically accused financial advisors, attorneys, financial advisors, attorneys, and other professionals of having two sets of documents saying that pro athletes often get charged more uh, than other people would. Um, do, do you think uh, Chris is uh, onto something or is he just, uh, is he just venting about the price he has to pay to a financial advisor? Yeah, I think he is. Uh, he's not the first person I've heard talk about this issue. It doesn't come up that often with professional sports, but a lot of times you're dealing with, you know, teenagers or people in their early twenties who are plucked straight out of poverty and turned into millionaires. And of course, there's going to be a lot of parasites that just attach themselves to these people to extract as much of that money from them as possible. And they have absolutely no idea that it's even happening to them in the first place. Um, a lot of these, a lot of these guys, you know, like I said, come right out of poverty and, you know, they don't come from families that have any wealth to manage in the first place. So it's not a skill that they have. Um, so yeah, I, I've heard, I've heard about this in the past and he's, probably onto something you may be right um like alex said there's there's parasites out there there's a lot of bad apples in our industry that's why it's so heavily regulated um if he could prove to a a judge and in, in a jury to to say that he was taken advantage of then um yeah he might be uh he might be right he might be entitled to some some money back but i don't know enough to to give a straight opinion um is is it was he charged fees um because if you charge one percent 
on $1,000, that's $10. You charge 1% on $100,000, that's $1,000. $1,000 is a lot more than 10. So person number two is paying a lot more than person number one, but they're still being paid the same ratio. Is it because he has millions under management? I don't know. So there's a lot of factors here. Um, yeah, he may be right, but I would have to know more to actually give a, a solid opinion. I think he's right. You know, when the famous bank robber, Willie Sutton, was asked the question, why do you rob banks? He says, because that's where the money is. Uh, if you want to go and steal, you know, why steal from a bunch of poor people making minimum wage when you can steal from millionaires who are fresh out of high school or fresh out of college who don't know any better? It's a target-rich environment to, to, to rip people off. Same as politics. It's like, uh, why is there so much corruption in, in, in government? Because that's where the money is. So uh, the answer is emphatically yes. Uh, the antidote is that uh, do your due diligence. Find a wealth manager that your parents are using. And if your parents don't have it, then go to a student, your student counselor or somebody you, you trust and ask who, uh, who helps them. Because yeah. uh, dollars to a donut, you find somebody that you trust who's got a financial advisor who's been around for 30 years. Um, uh, quite frankly, he's probably gonna be around 30 years for you too, or their firm will be. Yeah, that's a very good point is that a lot of these kids, you know, they come out of, you know, you know, a lot of times, especially in the NHL, you can get plucked out of you know, high school, you know, um, or what they call the junior league. So it's junior A and B. And a lot of times those kids are high school age or just just out of high school. So you're 19, 20 years old and you could be making, you know, 250,000, you know, to a million dollars a year. And you've never had time to think about, you know, anything financially related because you never had two cents to rub again in your life. And it's easy to get taken advantage of. And I'm sure there's people that do it. And I'm sure Chris, uh, prior, you know, he's made quite a bit of money in the NHL. And I'm sure he's run into a few bad apples. And the advice I'm giving, the advice he's given to other young pro athletes, I think is uh, is right. They need to, you know, you know, like Joe said, they need to do a lot of due diligence and find people they trust that kind of guide them in the right, right direction so they don't, uh, you know, they don't get fleeced. <clears throat> All right, moving on. Just a quick question: uh, Would you buy a Tesla? Um, generally, no. Uh, my main reason would be lack of charging infrastructure. If chargers were about as common as gas stations, I would at least consider it. Um, and if I were to, I would absolutely buy a Cybertruck. Same with Alex. If if I could charge it, and it wouldn't be an inconvenience any more than it is getting gas and I had enough money in my car fund to buy one with cash, yeah, I'd, I'd buy Tesla. If it was a better deal than an internal combustion engine vehicle, in a heartbeat, I'd buy a Tesla. Yes, emphatically so. Yeah, I, I go with, uh, you know, Ditto Alex remarks is that it'd be nice if they had like a more substantial truck. You know, I think Rivian worked on one, but uh, you know, it'd be, yeah, in Montana, it'd be nice to be driving a truck around uh, for a little bit, but sure. Yeah, if, if it worked out, um, you know, it'd be pretty hard to, to, to beat my uh, my gasoline-powered truck at this point in terms of cost, but uh, yeah, if the money was there, sure, I'd buy a Tesla. All right, uh, last question is that uh, NASA's Perseverance rover found a shiny silver object stuck between some rocks on Mars last week. Uh, NASA believes it's a thermal blanket that came loose while a spacecraft was landing on Mars but many people on the internet have speculated that it could be other things. Uh, what do you think they found? Now, NASA's lying, they're covering it up, it is definitely piece, a piece of a lost civilization. This is probably the one that visited Earth the last ice age and taught the Atlanteans how to build the Sphinx 12,000 years ago because it's not 4,000 years old. That's also a lie perpetrated by the Egyptian government. I was gonna think of something else but i like alex that that's convincing it's alien 100 percent. that's what it is it's space garbage basically just shows that, that humanity is just a bunch of slobs yeah I, I was gonna say it's it's a it's a gum wrapper from an alien and uh we're doomed good game america um yeah this will be our last episode so, but no, I mean, it's most likely a thermal blanket, uh, looks like it, but um, some of the conspiracy theories online have been pretty entertaining. So I just want to see what you thought about it. <laughs> all right, uh, that's all we have for uh, episode 44. Uh, so we'll, uh, uh, we'll see you next week.